presidents have a variety of mechanisms by which they can either interpret the Constitution or suggest that they have the right or power to interpret the Constitution. Uh, part of it is through the way in which they read the law or interpret uh, the law that they are given by Congress, what types of regulations they can issue, the uh, types of legislation on which they can issue either uh, formal regulations or informal guidance to the agencies. Uh, at the same time, in the same way that the Supreme Court reads the Constitution to mean certain things, the President, as the chief administrator of the federal government, can do the same. He can understand certain provisions of the Constitution uh, to mean certain things and to give him or his agencies not just power, but a requirement to act in a certain way. And so you will see constitutional uh, justifications in executive orders, in executive memoranda, in signing statements, in the variety of types of edicts that a president can issue oftentimes they will be steeped in and justified by provisions of the Constitution. In some sense, it gives the president the ultimate authority, but in another sense, it offers that type of legitimacy to the actions that he wants, often for very non-constitutional reasons. There has always been, since the, since the beginning of the Republic, a, a sense that the interpretation of the Constitution is not solely a matter for the United States Supreme Court. The, the logic behind that position is that the court is a passive decision-making body. It can only deal with cases or controversies that are brought to it and that it agrees to accept. And so there's an awful lot of political behavior that takes place well in advance of and, and, and completely apart from what any court, any, any of the most activist court with the most energetic possible, uh, energetically possible activist judges could deal with. And so uh, in, in that sense, there's always been this understanding that the president had a certain degree of latitude for determining what would be constitutional short of uh, uh, setting up a, uh, a, a Supreme Court case. Um, There's a famous instance, I believe, with, uh, um, I, I, I want to say with Andrew Jackson, where he said the justice has made his decision, now let him execute it. And that's the other piece of this, is that there are instances where presidents are told by the courts to, uh, that this is going to be what the law is, and the president has to decide how to execute it. A famous example of this, of course, is the Brown decision, uh, outlawing school desegregation in the mid-1950s, and it's left up to Dwight Eisenhower to figure out how to bring that about. Eisenhower, who was not in favor of the decision, uh, believed that he had to take a, a fairly slow approach to this and came under a lot of criticism. It's come under a lot of criticism historically for not being more aggressive, although when push came to shove in Little Rock, he did send the 82nd Airborne in to make sure that the, that, uh, the law would be followed. But there's a, there's, a, you know, there's a fair degree of, for lack of a better word, presidential prerogative in terms of deciding what, uh, you know, what, what genuinely is constitutional. The Supreme Court it has a unique role in the federal system. It is a, an entity that has august respect uh, from presidents and from Congress, even when presidents and Congress criticize the court for a given ruling. What you find is in June, the Supreme Court issues its most major decisions. And from day to day, the Republican Party will find the Supreme Court to be absolutely wonderful and the next day the worst institution in government and the Democrats are guilty of exactly the same sort of schizophrenia about their interpretation of the, of the court. It, at the same time, it is considered a critical part of the institutions of government and one that Congress and the president tend to respect the rulings of. And a president's relationship with the court typically stops with the appointment of the justices. Of course, the, uh, it is incumbent upon the, upon the president and his administration to defend laws in court and to go, appear before the court, but there is 
almost no evidence of presidents trying to influence the behaviors of Supreme Court justices, and that speaks to the institutional legitimacy of the system. But it is uh, the court that most often slaps down what a president does. It's not Congress who, who does it. And that, in many ways, is one of the more robust checks in the system, is the ability of the Supreme Court to limit presidential power in ways that Congress is, is crippled from doing. The common misperception about the American presidency is that is the, it is the dominant branch in government. But there are some very interesting examples, and I think teachable examples, of when the president is actually held back by the other two branches. Um, one is with President Clinton, and during his administration, he encouraged Congress to pass the line item veto, which means that instead of vetoing a bill, it's either all or nothing. You either veto the stem cell research bill or it goes into implementation. This was his, his way of being able to take a bill and to just deleting the items that he didn't like. So it was called the line item veto, and lots of state governors have it. So it's not anything that he you know, created or anything highly unusual. But at the time, Congress, uh, I would say to their detriment, passed in the, both the House and the Senate, the line item veto. Um, and President Clinton, of course, signed it because this was expanding his power. Instead of having to take an all or nothing bill, he could pick out the parts of the bill that he didn't like. And Congress at the time, I'm not sure what they were thinking because in effect what they did was they ceded authority to the president. They enabled the president to basically legislate. So the Supreme Court stepped in and the Supreme Court said, no, no, not so fast. The line item veto gave the opportunity to the Supreme Court to strike it down because it was a violation of separation of powers. It was effectively giving the president the power to legislate. So I think it, the line on a veto is a terrific example to teach students not only about the interaction of the presidency with the other two branches of government, but also to show how presidents can be held back and how the, how the courts can step in. Um, and those examples, I think, are hard to find. Checks and balances can still apply in a fairly, fairly robust way when it comes to the president's interpretation of the Constitution. Oftentimes, it emerges from a lack of clarity or a lack of precision in legislation or because it is engaging an area in which the Supreme Court or other federal courts have not engaged. And so while the president obviously needs to interpret the Constitution in certain ways in order to do his job, he also it can push Congress to be clearer in their legislation, motivate Congress to explain more what their expectations are, or in some cases, push the court, the Supreme Court, to rule on a provision of law or a provision of the Constitution that hasn't really been clarified yet. And so, all of that comes about, and we see it every year in a variety of ways, because of the system of checks and balances. That said, at the end of the day, the president acting as if he is the final arbiter of the Constitution is probably not what the founders intended.